and welcome to Facebook Live Singularity Hub. My name is Lisa K. Solomon. I am the Chair of Transformational Practices here. We are live at the Global Summit and I'm so excited to introduce you to Dan Klein, who I will be having a conversation with about improvisational theater and the practices that we can all learn to be more creative and innovative in our lives. Dan, thank you so much for joining oh, us. My pleasure, Lisa. Thanks for having me. Okay, so I'm sure that a lot of people, when I said improvisational theater, they might have thought of yeah. what's my line or yeah, yeah. some comedians that know how to do this. But you teach students and executives yeah. how to use improvisational practices in their everyday. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your work? Sure. I think that there's a there's actually a new a newer term for what I do, which is called applied improvisation. So some of the classes that I teach at Stanford are specifically in the theater department, teaching students how to get up on stage and perform made up shows, made up on the spot with an ensemble, sometimes musicals, sometimes Shakespeare, and it's theater. But a lot of what I do, I teach in the business school, I teach in the D school, is about applying those improv techniques into other domains. Uh, and helping people be more, um, be more resilient, be more collaborative, be more open, and connecting with each other in a way that can help them come up with new ideas to solve new problems. That really seems like the practices that are so core to being innovative sometimes. Yeah. A word we hear a lot, particularly yeah. here in Silicon Valley. Yeah. We've got to be more innovative. Yeah. But of course, being more innovative suggests that you need to start with a different frame of mind to, yeah. to be different. That's what I find, and I, I'm, I'm very excited and fortunate to get to be at Stanford now when things like the D School and teaching design thinking are so, uh, are so prevalent and have so much attention. Um, and I really believe that in many ways, the improviser's mindset is what sets us up to be able to be more effective in, in all phases of design thinking and problem solving. I, I think the improviser's mindset has a few, has a, a few components. Um, and the first one, the one I always start with, is reimagining failure. Um, and it's something that I learned from my mentor, who was uh, Patricia Ryan Madsen, who wrote the book Improv Wisdom, and she taught me that the key, we're, we're asking people in the classroom to take huge risks, to take creative risks that are personal and, uh, and, and, um, and scary, and in order to take risks, they have to feel safe. That was, the, that was the first and main thing that she taught, and I think everything else stems from that. So what I like to do in the classroom is make people feel safe in a number of different ways. One way you can make people sa feel safe is to lower the stakes. Um, but another is to actually uh, like re-engineer your response to failure. So embracing mistakes and embracing failure, failing cheerfully, are some of the mantras that we start with at the beginning of at the beginning of any session. And this is really valuable for it's you know for undergrads and for grad students, but also for executives and you know parents and lawyers and doctors. Everybody everybody benefits at some level from from examining what their natural response to failure is and then making a conscious adjustment to it. I've been privileged enough, Dan, to see that transformation when you've worked with executives. Yeah. And, and you don't just say the words, you actually get them to feel it. That's you get right. them to physically yeah. embody it. Yeah, I mean, that's what it is. I, I have a, it's kind of a, um, it's like a gift that I have that when they introduce me, they can say, well, Dan is a lecturer in the business school, but he's also a lecturer in the theater. And then that gives me permission to uh, come in with a different, say, I'm going to ask you to do something a little different. Um, in the theater, we work with the, with the body as the instrument, so let's try an experiment. And our natural physiological response to failure is fascinating. It's universal. It's like a, a cringe or a, right. a, a grimace or a flinch. Like these weird, like our, we do this cringing uh, response, and it's 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 universal. It's human. Right, it must be just biological. Yeah. yeah. Um, and but my guess is that it's learned in some way, like that we're guarding ourselves from punishment of some kind, from judgment or punishment. Right. And so I ask the students to do this experiment where, when you mess up on a really low stakes task, when there's really nothing, there's nothing going on here, just if you, you but you, if you mess up, celebrate by right. opening up. Throw your hands in the air, 
maybe even say, ta-da. Right, should we do it? One, yeah, two, three. Yeah, one, one two, two, three. three. Ta-da. <laughs> wow, yes. All right, I'm going to practice that. So you talked about these core tenets of an improviser's yeah. mindset. Another one that I've learned from you over the years is this notion of setting your partner up for success. Yeah, I think that's essential. And it, you know, I don't always say it. it, it it's, I'm trying to figure out the best way to get at it, but I think that one of the other keys to, to creativity and, and actually to being uh, being fully present and, and in a sense like a, a holistic being approaching any problem is to take the ego out of it. Like your, your own sense of yourself is um, is useful, but it's more destructive than 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 not when we're trying to come up with something new. And so a sense of yourself is like, well, I, I failed, I'm no good at this, or like there's a judgment, but even a positive assessment can get in the way. So if you think, I'm look how good I am, or right. look how great I did, then you're gonna be missing the exact next moment. So part of what I do to take the pressure off is I say, your job is not to be clever, or creative, or interesting, or funny, any of those things, your job is to make your partner look good. And people, go, people calm down when yes. they realize, oh, that's, yes. that's easier. I can, I, my job is to help them succeed, to give your partner a good time. People always wonder, like, what does it mean to be a good improviser? And Keith Johnstone, who's like the grandfather of improvisation, he said the real measure of a good improviser is someone who's fun to play with. Yes. And that's a huge, that is a, that is a revelation, because we're, from the outside, we think that the great improviser is the one who we admire yes, and is funny. So brilliant. It's the one that's fun to play with. And I've seen it over the, over the course of years. Anyone might have a good show or a good moment in a show, but it's the, the improvisers that, that people want to have with them on stage that are magic. It's really a very interesting way to think about, I wonder from our listeners uh, and, and viewers, think about who do I like to play with and exactly. who do I play with exactly. at work? Yeah. And when I'm in that mode of play, yeah. how do I feel? And, how, yeah. and, and from my experience, it's that priming that sets us up to have better ideas, yep. more expansive ideas. Yep. Yep. Uh, a larger number of ideas, yep. and yet we don't start mo most meetings with play. No, it, it's <laughs> weird. I mean, I guess it's maybe it's not that weird in that a lot of our a lot of our education seems to be designed to to um, teach the play out of us to get us to be more orderly, to yes. be more um, uh, thoughtful and judgmental, and to plan ahead and to be discerning. And these are a lot of the skills that we're. That, that we actually, in a sense, we need some kind of education to teach us, but it, it also seems like they're, they're sort of replacing that sense of play and spontaneity, that creative imagination, that spark that, it, that we need so critically to get really good things done. I, uh, one of the quotes I heard at the Global Summit uh, was that of Plato, who said that you can learn more in an hour of play than you can in a year of conversation. And so oh, lately yeah. I've been thinking about what is the power of playful conversations yeah. to really accelerate yeah. learning and possibility. Um, I want to talk about another area, Dan, that I know you focus on a lot. In fact, you ran a session here on, and yeah. that is story and yeah. story crafting. Yeah. And there was just standing room only. I mean, just electric <laughs> energy coming out. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Well, I, I'll say the trick to getting a standing room only uh, is to get a really small room. <laughs> No, I, it, that was a really fun workshop, but I, what, I, what I've gotten to do in the past few years, along with my partner, Michelle Darby, is teach a class at Stanford for the Stanford Storytelling Project, which is called Storycraft. And essentially, it's, um, it's uh, sharing with students how to mine their own life for stories, because we all have stories, and we're all, we're all natural story makers. And, but to, to mine your life for stories and then craft them, arrange them and put them together in the most effective way and then stand up in front of an audience and share that story. Wow. And it's an incredible, power, incredibly powerful event. We, at the end of every quarter we have a story night and the students get up and they, and they tell their stories. And they might be profound stories um, about life and death and, and, uh, or they might be you know, trivial stories about, uh, about you know, losing a, a favorite pen or whatever it is, losing a tooth, but they're all profound stories. Right. I mean, in a sense, the story that comes up in that process is the story that needs to be told. Um, and 
that's what uh, that's what's so exciting to me is to find when someone is telling something that's authentic, it's riveting. It doesn't. Yes. And then we apply meaning to it. We we make sense of it. That's what we do. That's what our brains, in a sense, are for. It's it can be so revealing, you know, about yeah. what story you pick and yeah. how you tell it. And why do you think it is so important for leaders to learn how to tell stories well, these days? Well, I, I think that it's. I mean, it's a critical. It may be the key leadership skill. I don't. I, I, it's nice to have a smart leader, but we know that sometimes that can get in the way of yes. <laughs> making good decisions or being an effective communicator. But it's absolutely clear that the best leaders are the best storytellers, and being able to tell an appropriate, effective story in the right context is a key marker of leadership. We know that people people think they make decisions based on data. They actually are making decisions based on their emotions, yes. and then they're backing it up with the data, yes. which, is, yes. which is fascinating. Fascinating. So the storytellers are the ones you're basically able to tap into those emotions that'll help people make their decisions and still capture the data that'll that'll help back it up. I think it's so important, particularly now, when we're experiencing, experiencing a time of increasing uncertainty and volatility yeah. and even yeah. vulnerability, yeah. Um, to tell positive stories about the future yeah. where others can find themselves in, tapping yeah. into that emotion yeah. and, and paying attention to that. What is the narrative that you are sharing yeah. and, and how are you choosing the right narrative at the right moment to right. really guide your organization, your teams yeah. in the right direction? Yeah. I mean, I think that really is the art of it. And there's a lot of people that, that do it instinctively and I think that's wonderful. But one of the things I've, I've noticed from, from doing these classes and working working with lots of executive groups is that you can do it instinctively, but when you do it intentionally, you absolutely can unlock the same power that like a natural storyteller does. Yes. And in fact, the ones that do it instinctively are in a little bit of danger because if you know they get a certain kind of feedback, yes. they may start in on their stories. That's right. They start winging it. Yeah. yeah. And yep. then and then they might be missing the moment, right? Yes. So. I think that the intentionality of bringing in some of these simple storytelling techniques uh, ends up making a much more effective uh, uh, leadership, but also you know helps helps an organization meet their meet their goals. What I like both about improv and storytelling, uh, just like you were saying, is that they are in fact practices. There are practices yeah. that we can get intentional yeah. about learning. And practice suggests that it's not a one-time thing. That's right. It is over time towards mastery. I think, yeah, I think you've got it exactly right. The um, I realized uh, a few years ago I got to uh, work with Carol Dweck, uh -huh. um, who wrote Growth and the Growth Mindset, and and then I realized that that's what Patricia Ryan Madsen was teaching us was that if you have a fixed mindset about creativity, about storytelling, about your capacity in any domain you may be limited in where in what you can do. It, but if you have a growth mindset, no matter where you start, you can always get better. And that and we have to be. So I tell one of the classes I teach at Stanford is uh, intermediate improv. And I tell my students that they are the in the most accurately named improv class <laughs> on campus because we just Beginning improv, we say beginning to lower the stakes right. for everyone. Say so you don't need to know anything to come. And advanced improv, we say advanced because we have to stoke the egos of the students that are in it. Right. But in actuality, we're all intermediate yes. improvisers, always, and that's how we should approach it. Well, Dan, I know that the most important thing in any practice is to just get started. Yeah, that's right. So what is one piece of advice that you might give to our, our viewers about how they can get started in either of these practices, oh, yeah. improv or storytelling? Well, I do, you know, um, practice, practice, practice. I think that's essential. There, the, the number of resources available, I, I love telling people to jump into an improv class. Like literally go to a theater where they're teaching improv and take a beginning class you don't have to have any intention of getting up on stage. You can have a secret desire to maybe someday have someone say, hey, you should be on stage. Yes. That's great, that's yes. fine. But you don't have to have that goal. And go to an improv class and, uh, and enjoy playing with, um, with you know, compatriots who are discovering these ideas together with you. Um, I also say practice telling stories. Like yes. there's no, we, we don't just fall out of bed and, and uh, uh, all of a sudden are, are doing it at a mastery level, but that's okay. Right. We, we practice telling stories. I think that there's, um, uh, 
I think that the book Improv Wisdom that Patricia Ryan Madsen wrote is an amazing handbook for non-actors who want to take on uh, more improvised life. And she has a ton of exercises in that book that just get you to practice right here in the moment. Just close the book, close your eyes, and see if you can remember all the things around you in the room and start to hone your ability to observe the environment. A key improv skill that we skip over and we ignore. That's so valuable, and I can personally vouch, improv wisdom is like a book of religion for yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. When I read that book, I felt so peaceful, so grounded, and so ready to yeah. want to try. I, that my experience with that book, I used to have students read it in like week six or seven, and then one, one quarter, my other book, Johnstone's book, wasn't available in the bookstore. So I said, okay, read, start with Improv Wisdom. And it made my students nicer. Like, <laughs> I, and now, that's what I, like, I only work with people who've already read Improv yes, Wisdom. They're right. more, that's it's a, more now it's a prereq. Yeah. 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 It's a prereq. Well, Dan, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing with us your wisdom. Uh, your passion for improv and story crafting and really helping all of us learn how to be more collaborative, creative, and more future-oriented for what we want to bring to life. Oh, thank you, Lisa. It's always an honor to get to work with you. Oh, thank you. Thank you.